And someone asked, why aren't they advertising more about this? My guess is they're going to do, and we, we talked about this two years ago when we were doing this, uh, they're going to take the market how they want to take the market. And they are slow rolling this strategically in the way that they want to. No one's going to tell them anything different because Peter Thiel and Carp have F shares and they're, they can't be bought out. And we say they, slow, but in 10 weeks, they have 400 customers in the pipeline. Right, so right, right, right. Slow. Yeah, but I'm just saying they're wanting to use that unique business model. And in fact, I think ah, I can't give credit to who on Twitter – Anjay or something. Andre. Andre. Yeah. Said the most profound thing when he talked about, or he actually interviewed someone who got a job at Palantir and they looked at Snowflake and they looked at Databricks and they said, you know, these will do X, Y, and Z. He said, but Foundry will change your entire business and how you operate and change everything. And so when you look at that, that's not a quick sale. That's not a quick adoption. You start with like building Lego blocks, right? You yeah. build, build a little block here. We've got a use case. Okay, we got to win. Now they're giving us more money to try this other department, right? So that scale process takes a while. But then you look at what the top seven or 10 customers for Palantir are doing. They're still growing 14, 15% every year. Um, that's showing you that they've found that scale motion with those. So I think we'll really see a lot more as time goes on. Just got to be patient. They're not I think another, another piece of it as well is like advertising is a tricky business. When you see an advertisement in the airport, who are you advertising to? You're advertising to the everyday person. So why yeah. does that ever matter? Like yep. I, I can't go into undisclosed oil company and make a decision, right? So who are you going to call? You're going to call the CEO, the CTO, the people that can actually make that decision. So in reality, it's just like, okay, why aren't they advertising more? Why aren't they advertising more? It's like the same reason why you don't get a ticket, me, you, well, I, I think we should get tickets to AIP Con or Foundry Con, but magically you see all these companies showing up and presenting. It's like, that's who they're going for, right? That's their advertisement. So why, why would they be wasting money if they could just pick up the phone and get the call to directly the decision maker themselves? And so well, that's- guys, uh let me be the more technical the more financial geek guy here then and the, the answer of why palantir doesn't spend more is actually very strictly connected with uh, gap profitability uh, the That's amount of point. money a good point. can <laughs> actually spend uh, depends on uh, what is not uh, how much dollars we can spend is uh, what's the mo the biggest amount of dollars we can actually spend uh, while keeping up profitability to, go, to keep gap profitability, it means that you are not overspending and you have a big chunk of uh, around 20% of uh, stock-based compensation on revenues, which means uh, that uh, the most money you can spend on uh, cash is uh, 75%. So if the adjusted EBIT margin is 25%, then you have a chunk of uh, stock-based compensation that keeps that down. And now we have a 2% operating margin on a gap basis. It means that Palantir is already spending the most uh, given its limit on, uh, let's say, it's like saying, uh, I want to stay green at the end of the month after all my bills are expensed, but I just need to be positive. I don't need yeah. to be extremely positive. So what do you do? You actually spend, spend the most but a little bit of dollars just to stay positive. And, and uh, that's what's happening with Palantir. So maybe they would want to spend more, but now they are basically spending the most given the constraint. In a, in yeah, a, a, AIP they, con probably cost them a couple million bucks. Well, I think, like, you know, Carp said this directly in the earnings report, right? People were like, well, wh why are you doing X, Y, and Z? It's like, well, we want to make sure people don't want to use a company that isn't necessarily profitable. They think they want something that can last for five to 10 years. And so we said that was, you know, as much as you, if you actually are intelligent, you read through the earnings report and you have the time to do so, you know, that the cash position in the company has been building yeah. that the only reason why they're not income positive on a gap basis is because of stock based compensation. But if you look at their actual non gap, they've been making money, you know, for the past several quarters, if not longer. 
and their free cash flow is positive on an adjusted basis, kind of going over the past, say, six to eight quarters. And so obviously they wouldn't be building a cash position if that wasn't true. So I see what Arnie is saying. It's like they're basically playing this financial engineering game to be like, okay, well, we can only spend this much this quarter for, say, operating expenditures because we want to make sure that we maintain profitability. And my question kind of going forward is, is like, are they going to, now that they're at this point, are they going to continue to kind of use that as a floor? To me, I think that that's the most prudent thing to do because I care about where we're going to be in 10 years from now. I don't care about the next two quarters. And so I would be okay if they're not profitable today, because if that meant higher revenue growth in the short term, I'd be okay with that personally. But anyway, uh, I cut you off, Arnie. That's the critique uh, that Palantir is receiving. Uh, people are uh, now expecting, uh, yes, but Palantir is more a startup-like uh, kind of companies. Uh, they should uh, invest more to grab market share. And that's true. But uh, paradoxically, we know that uh, if uh, clients want Palantir to actually be to stay uh, strong on a free cash flow basis, have a lot of cash in the bank, uh, and also being uh, gap profitable, there is a paradox that Palantir is actually getting a marketing e- expanding expenses so basically is marketing themselves better it has it has a better brand awareness by spending less rather than spending more in a context where basically all the SaaS companies are actually suffering in this chart that i shared a couple of days ago we can see that the slowdown of uh, palantir growth is not uh, only related to palantir it's actually a sectorial thing and uh, I'm wondering, uh, and this is an open question for you. These are, these are SaaS companies, Arnie? That this have is the cloud index that uh, incorporates basically all the cloud companies okay. div- divided by quartile so that you can we can have a sense of uh, is uh, this uh, average, this median reflecting uh, to the aggregate, which is uh, very close altogether, or there are some kind of extremes uh, on the upper side uh, and on the lower side. And we can see that basically all the SaaS companies, regardless if they are top quartile, bottom quartile, are affecting. So this chart actually shows that uh, the slowdown of Palantir matches perfectly the slowdown in the overall spending in software. So my question for more dumb, but actually for all of you is how this uh, should actually last still, especially if there is a high demand for AIP. So in another way to formulate it is uh, if there is a high demand for s- chips right now for AI, how long does it actually take in the software side uh, to actually see some changes? It's a loaded question. <clears throat> I'll try to answer the best I can. I, I know I have the best answer. Dom will give a long answer. My answer is very quick. Yeah, I'm sorry. Jerome Powell needs to cut rates. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we got I it. was we actually got going it. there with rates on it. You'd be proud right. of me. I uh, stole your thunder. Um, you know, money was at 0% two years ago, and we were seeing crazy growth rates. And every, I mean, companies were trying to grow at all costs, like just throwing money at the wind, right? And then everyone got caught with their pants down and inflation. And um, then it was like a big clawback of let go people. We hired too many people. We got to get profitable. I I think, you know, I'll give Alex and his team and his CFO credit. They've been really, really good about being good stewards of protecting the business with zero debt, three billion in cash, still double digit growth. I think the decline, Arnie, to answer your question, is very in line with what we're seeing across the SaaS market. Uh, Customers are are really having to justify spend right now. Um, And so also something that makes makes me think about their business model is keep in mind, they only have about 4,000 employees. And the stock-based compensation is still pretty heavy to keep the super talented 4,000 employees. What they can't afford is losing those employees, right? Those employees know tribal knowledge. They know the platform. They know the customer base. So they don't have the luxury with rates not at zero to to grow super fast and focus on growth. Right now, what they need is quality growth. And as customer, they will get the incremental revenue as customers use the platform more because it's a pay as you go. Yep. But they can't be burning through customers and flipping through. They actually need quality growth. Yeah, that's fair. Arnie, go ahead. 
you may say that. No, no, no. I was thinking, uh, um, like, if I have to speculate from what's the gap between hardware spending and actually seeing some results, I would say six months. What are your uh, best guesses? So what? That's going to be March 2024, you think? I think we just had the int. Do you remember the chart where I plotted the, the growth of the guidance expected? Mm -hmm. And this was the very first time in the Pantheus history since listed that they actually raised the guidance. Because since they were listed, basically every quarter, they guided for a revenue growth that was actually slower than the previous quarter. So we had this chart going down, 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 13%. And now this is the first time that they actually guided for a 16% growth. 16, okay. yeah. It's not that much, but if we can infer, okay, maybe it's just a 30% per quarter. It's like a 16, then a 19, 22, uh, whatever. So clearly now this is very speculative. But that trend, the, that trend shift could be actually very meaningful. And that's why I say maybe three months just to see something. And in six, nine months, uh, we could actually see, okay, now it's time. Because we kept it mentioning uh, in, uh, at the Palantir Weekly, but I think it's worth uh, mentioning a lot. While we see the stock moving uh, closer as a cluster, maybe uh, NVIDIA app uh, because it's AI and all the AI companies, and there are not many like uh, C3 AI, Palantir are the two poor AI play, as also Daniel uh, said. It's not that because that is uh, the reality because there are actually other companies uh, doing AI, like a service now is also doing AI, but from how institutional investors uh, reason, they want pure a pure plays. Pure plays means that uh, I put money on a company that clearly reflects a theme. They don't really care of Palantir being Palantir, the culture. From how most asset managers reason, they want a company that exposes them to a theme. So on the stock, all the cluster tends to move uh, together. So clearly NVIDIA is uh, then uh, more directly linked also to MD, uh, AMD and, uh, well, Intel more or less, but these other companies. On the other side, the business is very different. If there is a, a huge increase in demand, we see a huge spike in the CPUs that actually NVIDIA sells. But uh, on the software side, that only means uh, we have uh, demand. So before this demand actually becomes revenues, there is a long sales cycle that uh, we knew typically was uh, six, nine months, uh, that now maybe it could be shorter just because there is high demand. And when there is high demand, maybe in order to be faster than your competitors, you speed up uh, things. So that's why the reasoning uh, of my six, uh, nine months uh, pr prediction to say, okay, in six, nine months, uh, we will actually see uh, some, some results of this uh, high spec in uh, demand. I think all of that makes sense unless Palantir decides when we're still not going to monetize AIP. Because let's say they, they just gave it to 400 clients. Let's say it takes 12 to 18 months for them to recognize the value of AIP. Not saying they wouldn't get any value before that, but like truly come to the conclusion that they're ready to buy. If that's the case, and again, this is what Arnie, this has kind of been your point since earnings, which is like, let's 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 level our expectations with revenue growth because we know it's coming in the future. But the question is, is the macro controlling or NVIDIA's GPU demand controlling the AIP revenue monetization? Or is it just eventually time to value and then Pounter ends up closing the deal and then deciding a pricing? Because they don't even have a pricing strategy, right? The Carp's probably thinking about that every day. How the hell do we price this once BP comes back to us and says we're ready to buy it? So it's going to be an interesting nine months for them to end up figuring that out.